The eight essential elements of fast websites with Joel Alderson. The InSearch SEO podcast is brought to you by Rank Ranger, the all-in-one SEO platform that helps scale your business through data and analytics. Hey, it's David. How speedy is your site? We all know that a slow site negatively impacts user behavior. But are you really doing everything you can to minimize your site speed? Today, we're discussing the eight essential elements of fast websites with a man whose favorite things are web development, futurology, WordPress, science fiction, and gin. And who's happiest when knee deep in PHP on stage or reading a good book. He is a digital strategist, marketing technologist, and full stack developer, and is head of SEO at Yoast. A warm welcome to the InSearch SEO podcast, Jono Alderson. Hey, um, good to be here. Thanks for having me. This is um, super exciting. Oh, superb, Jono. Good to have you on. Well, you can find Jono over at jonoalderson.com. So, Jono, um, what would you say are the current stats on how a slow site actually impacts user behavior? Oh, there is so much research. And I think None of it's news. There's research going back decades now, um, and all of it says that there is a surprisingly direct correlation between how many milliseconds you make people wait and how much that affects their likelihood to buy something. I don't. It, it's probably not the case that people are consciously saying, "Ooh, that took 200 milliseconds too long," and I'm going to shop with your competitor. But it is a period during which they might look out the window or open another tab or wonder what's for lunch, and all of that erodes their likelihood to stay in the moment and and to convert and to take action. Um, I saw some really interesting research recently um, from Deloitte, a big consultancy firm, and they'd looked at something like um, a subset of 50 of the biggest, oh no, 50 uh, different sites across e-commerce and lead generation and different sectors in the UK and the US. And they'd found something like a 200 millisecond delay, which is the time it takes you to blink, um, reducing their site speed by that increased revenue by something like 10%. And this is just one such study. There are many like this, and all of them just say that faster, sleeker, more accessible, more usable just means more money. So yeah, it's a no-brainer for us to be looking at this. Yeah, I remember seeing a study um, by Amazon, I think it was years ago, over over 10 years ago, but I, I hadn't seen up-to-date uh, stats on it. But it's, it's surely all comparable comparative as well, because um, if people are used to browsing other websites and they see your slide is a whole lot slower than other websites, then they're not going to stick around too long. Yeah. And people really don't think about this, right? They think, oh, our site's probably fast enough, but your competitor's sites are getting faster. Facebook's getting faster. Instagram is getting faster. The expectations of where the baseline of that user experience is changes. So you've got to be getting faster, faster than that expectation. Otherwise you're getting slower comparatively. So today you're sharing the eight essential elements of fast websites. So starting off with number one, core web vitals. Sure. So I think there might be some more outside of this, but this is definitely my go-to list. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of core web vitals by now, but if you haven't, um, Google launched this, I think, in mid-2020, and it's their attempt at creating some kind of standardized universal metrics for measuring what page speed is. Because technically and conceptually, that's quite complex. Pages loading, there's all sorts of different stages and all sorts of different things that are it. So they simplified it down into a set of metrics that you can monitor and trend and analyze over time. Um, the really nice thing about this is um, it, this is just step one. There are three metrics at the moment. We're getting two more this year. The metrics themselves are evolving. This is becoming a really kind of mature ecosystem for putting hard numbers against these kinds of measurements, which means it gets much easier as a business to say, look, we're scoring not very well. Our competitors are scoring better. We know all the research says this ties back to revenue. We should be focusing on improving these. So suddenly we have a way that we can convince stakeholders that not only is speed important, but also we have a a measurement that everyone will agree on that isn't opinionated, that isn't the SEO guy in the corner saying, well, I disagree with the dev in that corner and not really having a shared language. So yeah, this is really powerful as a business tool, never mind just a technical measure. I know your brain's saying, I I can't commit to saying that there are only eight um, most important, fastest things that you can actually do to to prove our website. Uh, I know your brain can actually think of 1,024 things at the moment, but uh, we're just um, sharing the eight initial 
ideas that you came up with when we just discussed that a little bit earlier on as well. So um, number two was Cloudflare. Yeah, if I had only enough time and resource to just do one thing to speed up my website, it would be go and install Cloudflare. And I know there's still, so Cloudflare is huge. They're like one of the biggest tech, tech companies in the space, yet there are tons of development teams and businesses who have understandably never heard of them because it's a bit nerdy. Um, Cloudflare is a content delivery network. It's a piece of infrastructure that sits in front of your website. They have have a free version. It takes about 10 minutes to set up and they just use magic to speed up your site. And they so they automatically shrink your images, they minify your JavaScript, they change how things load, they make sure that connections route more efficiently around the globe for different users in different places, and a thousand other things. And these, these are all things that you could, in theory, do some of if you had a dev team who were very smart and very well resourced. But why would you when the Cloudflare free product does most of it and like the $20 a month one does pretty much all the rest? So if you've got a site that's maybe not scoring very well, that's maybe a bit slow, you could take a site that takes six seconds to load down to two seconds just by clicking a few of the buttons. So the kind of basic level is phenomenal, but then the power users and advanced cases, you can go even further. You can say, I want to more deeply integrate Cloudflare into how my site works, and I want to offload some of this business logic, and I want to run this tagging and this tracking and analytics on the edge in the cloud near to where the user is. So it's a really phenomenal tool for just saying, look, if we, if we struggle to actually make our site itself faster, or we're on legacy hardware, or our hosting's a bit naff, you can just say, actually, we'll get Cloudflare to sit in front of all of that and never have to worry about it again. I mean, that raises some interesting questions around how much should different pieces of the stack be responsible? How much do you want to be offloading business logic? But as a quick hack, it's a phenomenal tool. And number three, use Chrome developer tools to spot performance bottlenecks. Yeah, so running Core Web Vitals tools like um, PageSpeed Insights and um, Web Page Test will give you top level scores and some generic advice. And the problem with generic advice, like use less JavaScript, is that it's not really going to be very easy to apply that to your website and your challenges. Your website's unique, it's built in a very specific way. If you want to get to the next level of really spotting where the opportunities are, you need to look at how your website loads. And one of the best tools you can use for that is Chrome Developer Tools. So I'm on a Windows computer, so I hit F12 in a browser. I'm sure there's a Mac equivalent. And I get the um, Inspect Overview, and you can click the Network tab, and you get a water full diagram that shows you all of the things that load on your page in the order they load and how long they take. And if you hit refresh a few times, you can watch that happening and you start to see patterns. And you don't have to be a massively um, in-depth developer to see that, oh, look, this one specific thing takes twice as long as everything else. And it's holding up a bunch of stuff. And oh, look, that it's a big JPEG. Maybe we should shrink this JPEG. So as a way of diagnosing your site specifically, page by page or template by template, it's a really powerful way of seeing where the biggest offenders are. And yes, there's nuance outside of that, but going, how do I fix the biggest bottleneck means that everything that that held back then loads faster. And as a way of kind of cherry picking and spotting easy opportunities, this is a great way to approach it. Find the thing that's holding up other things and just make that a little bit faster. And you can screenshot that and pass it on to your developers, et cetera, and they should be able to attack whatever that is. And number four, use advanced image optimization techniques. Yeah, so I mentioned big JPEGs as an example, and this is still embarrassingly common. Like one of the big reasons that many sites are slow is that somebody uploaded a 10 megabyte GIF onto their homepage, or they've taken a picture with their mobile phone or their camera, and they've just plonked it in the CMS. And there's no logic in place that says, maybe we should shrink that a little bit. Maybe we should fit it to the size. So many, many of the times when you're looking at Chrome developer tools and Cloudflare, um, you'll see that the bottleneck is, it just takes a long time to load this image because it's big. There are all sorts of tools you can use to, to address that. Um, the most important one is um, whatever process you're using to produce those images probably has a workflow. If you're making stuff in Photoshop, when you're exporting stuff, make sure that you're exporting for web, that you're thinking about, does this JPEG really need to be perfect pixel quality, or can we reduce the quality a bit and maybe save on um, file size? If all that's a little bit technical, go to squoosh.app. Uh, S-Q-O-O-U-S-H. Um, it's a tool built by some of the Google development team. Um, they're super nerdy. They're really into the image, image space. You drag and drop your image in, and it gives you options that you can click for, actually, I want this to be a PNG rather than a JPEG. I want to drag and drop, and as I do so, I can see the quality changing in the image. Okay, where am I happy with that trade-off? And, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of advanced checkboxes I can click and see what happens and shave off another few kilobytes here and there. And you can very easily get an image that's, say, two megabytes down to, 
200 kilobytes in just a few seconds of dragging and dropping and playing with those settings. As in, like, it's not very baked into your workflows, but as a quick fix to um, shrink down some of those big bottlenecking images, it's really, really cool. Yeah, I need to get on top of image optimization because um, <laughs> I hate to admit it. But I'm actually still using Macromedia Fireworks uh, to produce oh, images. Oh, I missed That's a piece that. of software. I missed Fireworks. <laughs> from 15 there was a good years decade ago. or so where that was my toy. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Toy. And I create an image, and then I export it as a, a JPEG at about eighty percent quality, and go. That's that's okay for the web, but maybe that was something from about <laughs> yeah. ten years ago. Yeah. That's probably a lot of people's workflow um, where uh, they are just going, okay, we'll put it out at 80% and it'll be fine. And that will, for the most part, be fine, but occasionally stuff's going to slip through. And if you're wanting to kind of do that unbottlenecking and unblocking, it's really worth spending the time looking at every single image and saying, am I happy with these trade-offs and the size? Absolutely. And for a hyper-fast, modern site that's going to compete with the best out there, what I've just described ain't, ain't certainly going to be able to do that. Um, <laughs> So that brings us up to number five, which is use advanced font opt optimization techniques. Yeah, so I mentioned that big JPEGs are often a blocking issue and one of the big offenders. The other one is fonts, um, Google fonts in particular, or in fact, any fonts that you're loading from like a third party domain. Um, these are so often the slowest thing on the page, the biggest thing on the page. And you'll see this all the time as a user when you're loading a page, it takes a few seconds to sort out and then the font flashes in. It's a really bad user experience. It's really bad in a whole bunch of ways for Core Web Vitals. Um, but there are fixes. Um, so the, one of the problems with Google Fonts is, and similar is that you make a cross-domain connection, which takes a little while. The thing you're connecting to queries a whole bunch of backend systems. That takes a while. It spits the font back. You've then got to download that font. Then you've got to render it. There's like five steps in that process, and it takes seconds, and there's no way to make that faster. So one of the easiest wins is localize those fonts. Don't load them from Google Fonts. Ignore the instructions Google Fonts gives you on copying and pasting CSS. Do a bit of Googling and find some guides on how to self-host those fonts, and that will vary based on your setup and your CMS. Typically, there are plugins and processes to make this pretty straightforward. That shaves off all of that. And then the other thing you want to do is look at actually what is this font I'm loading and how am I loading it? So um, modern font loading CSS, you can define specific character sets. So if you know that your website is, for example, mostly in English, you probably don't need to be loading the font characters for a whole bunch of extended Latin glyphs which actually happens by default. So the font you're loading, you're only using for A to Z and 1 to 9, but actually you're loading 200 odd characters that never appear on your pages. Right. So if you can carve that up, that's much faster. And then also you can say, do I want this font to um, load quickly, but potentially not be cached? Or do, where are the trade-offs in how, I how long I want to wait for it to load? And do I fall back to something else? Or do I just show a, an empty space where it should be? There are different settings you can tinker with this and there are tools you can Google for optimizing it. Um, but yeah, really in the same way as images, you want to look at every single bit, really interrogate how you're loading those fonts. CSSTricks.com has some great guides for a um, whole bunch of ways that you can go and cherry pick this. But again, look at your CMS and your stack. There will be plugins and processes to make this easy. Great. Okay. And um, number six, use CSS and JavaScript tricks. Yeah. So the next most common offender, <laughs> it turns out it's all the stuff, is how um, styles and scripts are loaded. And if you have a website that has lots of complex visual stuff and maybe has movement and interaction and widgets and things you can click on and do stuff with, it's almost certainly the case that the CSS and JavaScript used to power that takes a while to load, interacts with the page in different ways. Um, you'll see this in your Chrome Developer Tools report when you're looking at that waterfall of are these things holding up other things? JavaScript is a really bad offender for this. If I have a script that's powering, say, a carousel at the top of my page, I don't want to have to wait for that script to load before that carousel starts scrolling. So there's a few things you can do with this. One is you can just make them smaller. Cloudflare is really good at this. If it's smaller, it's less bytes, it's faster to load. But the other thing you can do, which is really powerful, is say, actually, this, this JavaScript file I don't need to load immediately. I can wait until the page is done. And there are different ways you can do that. You can load it asynchronously. You can defer it. Deferring is typically the best practice nowadays. Um, people do all sorts of weird stuff with combining async and defer that makes a mess. But just um, using the defer attribute on JavaScript files that you don't need right away can make your page so much faster. So if I've got some JavaScript that controls something in the footer, I really don't need to wait for that 
to load the rest of the page, especially when you consider that the way that JavaScript and CSS interact gets quite muddy. Like if I've got lots of scripts, uh, lots of styling on my page, some of that is going to wait until the JavaScript's loaded. So you've got things holding up other things all over the place. So being really tactical in saying, I don't need this immediately can unlock huge performance boosts. And again, this is really easy to see where those are, offenders are in Chrome Developer Tools. And if you've got development resources, it's super easy to do this. You literally just add uh, an attribute to the tag and it does it automatically. And number seven, get the most out of caching and versioning. Yeah, so one of the cloud, one of the things that Cloudflare does really well is um, when it first encounters a resource, whether that's an image or a piece of JavaScript or a style, it saves it into Cloudflare. And then anybody who asks for that in the future gets the cached version. And that's served from somewhere super local to them. That's super efficient, really nice. Some websites, many websites, work in a way that makes that quite tricky. Um, for example, um, you want to be making sure that you're versioning your style sheets and your scripts. So when you publish your latest version of your piece of JavaScript, you want to say, this is version 6. And then that can get cached nicely by Cloudflare and for everyone who visits it. When you make updates to it, you want to change that file type, change the file name, say this is version 7. And then all of your caches have expired, people are requesting a different resource, and they start getting that new one really quickly. Um, where this starts to get really powerful is when you start caching the actual web pages themselves. So Cloudflare by default will only cache bits of JavaScript, bits of CSS. You want to be caching the web pages. But um, you want to do that in a way that's um, not going to accidentally cache people who are logged in or people who have stuff in their shopping cart. If you're on WordPress, there's a plugin by Cloudflare called, uh, they have a service called Automatic Platform Optimization, which does, does this automatically. So now you're serving your website from wherever the nearest Cloudflare data center is to your user, and they're getting a cached saved version of it in 50 milliseconds rather than 600 milliseconds. Um, if you've got a more complex website setup, you can do this with Cloudflare with um, the, the workers product, which lets you, and the page rules product, which lets you define some of your own logic for that. But basically the premise is you don't want your website to be doing anything. If somebody's opening your pages, you want that page, you want every bit of JavaScript, every bit of styling to be served from wherever the nearest data center is from you. My servers are in Norway, I think, but if you open my website now, everything on it comes from Manchester because that's the nearest place that Cloudflare have a data center. Um, and then, yeah, you can tinker away with this. Um, you can look at this in Chrome Developer Tools. You can add um, an extra column to the view that says, is this cached in Cloudflare? And you can start to cherry pick and tweak those settings to make sure that nothing is ever hitting the back end. And that takes us up to the last one. Number eight, use Clever Third Party Kit. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of stuff you can just bolt on to cheat with some of this. I've got two real favorites at the moment. Um, one is Instant Page, which is at instant.page, which is an interest, interesting domain. Um, this is really cool. So it doesn't make your site faster right away, but it makes subsequent navigation faster. So when a user moves their mouse over a link on your page, it preloads it in the background of your browser so that as they click, it's already available. And they've got a whole bunch of research that says, oh, the average person moves their mouse over a link for, I don't know, 60 milliseconds before they actually click. So there's a little bit of buffer time there. And in that 60 milliseconds, that's just enough time to start loading the page in the background. So it feels instantaneous. And there's a few reasons why that's really nice. One, um, that's a great user experience. Two, it impacts your Core Web Vitals. Even though it's not the initial page load, Core Web Vitals is aggregating um, speed and loading times across your whole site and your URLs. So if those navigations are super instant, that's going to do wonders for your overall scores, which might get you closer to that holy grail of improved Google rankings. For the more technical people, um, the other toy I'm really into at the moment is Party Town. Um, and the premise is that some of the stuff you're loading on your site is third party. And that's often tracking pixels and Google Tag Manager and maybe other odds and ends. You don't want that stuff competing with the main important stuff that's critical to your website. So if I've got a bunch of JavaScript that powers the page loading, I don't want Google Tag Manager to be loading up against that and stealing resources and then fighting. I want to really separate those things so that my, my page and the browser knows that it should really be prioritizing the stuff that's critical and that the third party stuff can happen in the background, it can happen separately. And from a tech perspective, it loads all of these third party resources in a separate worker, which um, means it happens outside of the normal stream, it doesn't impact performance, it happens quietly in the background. I've seen some incredible performance gains from this sort of stuff. I think this is very much where performance optimization is going. It's a little bit techy to set up, doesn't work perfectly with all stuff, but if you really want to get ahead of the competition, this is a really cool toy to play with. It's a little bit beta, but it's worth exploring. 
I was trying to have a look for the URL for Party Town, actually, because um, obviously if you search Google for it, it's, it's quite tricky to find. But um, is it on GitHub? <laughs> yes, yes, I've just pinged you a link that I'm sure we can share. Yeah, it's very beta. It's very GitHub. It's very nerdy and developer at the moment. Wonderful stuff. Okay, so well, let's finish off with... The Pareto Pickle. So Pareto says that you can get 80% of your results from 20% of your efforts. What's one SEO activity that you would recommend that provides incredible results for modest levels of effort? Um, the best um, advice I can give on that is to ignore the Pareto optimal for SEO. I don't think that's how this works <laughs> anymore. I think um, that's great advice if you are our grandparents operating a brick and mortar retail store 100 years ago. I think our ecosystem is different. And I think for SEO in particular, the way you win is you make a hundred small changes, one at a time, iteratively, today and tomorrow until you die. Otherwise, your competitors <laughs> are moving faster. Like, it's all about quality and about brand and about business, right? If anything that you can tactically just say, oh, I'll just do this, your competitors can do that as well. So yes, there's potentially some, some clever answers like, oh, I don't know, double down on your brand reputation, because that's definitely going to do well. But that's such a big, complex thing. And I think a much better way mm. of thinking about it is this afternoon, what 10 things can I improve? And just go and do that. And they don't have to be huge. They don't have to be clever. Just iterate and get better. So you don't have to prioritise things, because surely some things have a greater impact than other things. Yeah, but the, the big things all just turn, come down to be the better solution, have the better content, be better product market aligned, uh, in, impress and help your audience better. And none of those are tangible, tactical things you can do, I don't think. Actually, I, I lie, I lie. The thing you can do, the 80% is go get Cloudflare. Change my mind. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Like, I was going to say, including these thoughts and many other thoughts through our conversation, we could have gone on and recorded a full podcast episode just on that, but uh, perhaps for another occasion. For now, I'll say I've been your host, David Bain. You can find Jono over at jonoalderson.com. Jono, thanks so much for being on the InSearch SEO podcast. Thanks for having me. This was delightful. And yeah, it'd be nice to go even further. And thank you for listening. Check out all the previous episodes and sign up for a free trial of the Rank Ranger platform over at rankranger.com. <laughs>